let's go back nine years. I'm just your average college sophomore, more concerned about the social scene than the world at large. It was a Friday morning, and I'm running about 15 minutes late to class because I was just enjoying that social scene the night before, and all I was thinking about is what door I was going to get in or what excuse I was going to make up to get out of trouble. When I opened the door to the science building, I saw this poster, and it was of a guy sitting in what looked to be Everest Base Camp with a saying, and it said, Imagine where the journey will take you. And for some reason, that poster really spoke to me that day, and it seemed a lot more interesting than trying to sneak into class, so I skipped class that day and hopped on a computer to see what that poster was offering. So let's fast forward two years, so we're still back seven. Uh, I begin to panic as I watch the in-flight tracker in front of me tell me I'm somewhere over northern Africa, but I was, I was getting very nervous. You see, that poster was offering a one-year, all-expenses-paid trip around the world of a topic of my choosing. And I translated my upbringing on a cattle farm in West Virginia into studying cattle cultures around the world for a year. I called it my bovine bonanza. <laughs> and you see, I began to panic because during all that planning and preparation over those two years, I somehow managed to missed that I didn't really know anybody in Tanzania where I was heading, and I didn't really know how I was going to learn about the Maasai, who I was going to go learn about, and they're the most famous cattle herders in all of East Africa. Minor details. So let's fast forward 48 hours now. I'm now the honored guest at a Maasai wedding. After donating two cases of Coca-Cola to the wedding party, which is apparently a very big deal, I was being force-fed homemade alcoholic brews that looked and smelled like urine and soon being thrown into the dance circle under the full moon. It was pitch black. And one thing you need to know about the Maasai is that they're world-renowned for their leaping ability. They can jump through the, through the roof, and it may have been the fact that I drank a little too much of, the, of their homemade brew or the fact that it was pitch dark or the fact that I was a kicker in American football and not a basketball player that my first leap, I landed straight on my face. And that was my introduction to traveling. And I've never, really never looked back. But before I go forward, I want to make an important distinction. There's a difference between vacation and traveling. Now, we Americans, we love to vacation. We vacation all the time. Think of a cruise or a, a beach or maybe even a somewhat more adventurous trip, but you have everything planned in advance. You have a script that you follow to the team. Well, I'm talking about traveling, and traveling is a little more unplanned, spontaneous, and experiential, where you have a couple, a couple things planned, a couple ideas of what you want to do, but you meet another traveler, or you meet a local, and the word of mouth traveler culture takes its course, and you drop everything and go do what they tell you to do. The travel authority, Rick Steves, likes to say that traveling is entering a country through the back door, while vacation is entering through the front. And I'd like to talk about traveling here today. Since that introduction, I've spent nearly three years on the road in one form or another, from backpacking through Central and Southern Africa to searching for Bushman cave paintings in the Namibian desert to visiting homeless cow shelters on a pink motorcycle in the Indian Himalaya to working at a beach hostel in Uruguay to becoming a founding member of a traveling startup in Buenos Aires. Traveling has sort of become my life. But I started noticing a theme throughout my travels. That was, that was that all my friends were European or Canadian or South African or Aussies or Kiwis or even Israelis, virtually every other Western country but the United States. And I, I met some Americans traveling, but most of, the, most of the people, most of the Americans I met were on vacation or just on short stays. And I thought about it long and hard, like why, why are there not many Americans traveling like so many other Western countries, and I think I finally figured it out. It's that we Americans, we don't, we don't value travel like other countries do. Getting lost in a forgotten part of the world, that's not, that isn't, there's, no, there's no value to our culture. We don't see the value in it. But I disagree. I think there is a value, and that's an educational value. Now, I can honestly say that the three years I've spent on the road, I've learned more about the world and myself than my undergraduate and law degrees combined. 
I didn't receive a diploma or I didn't receive a piece of paper to justify that experience, but I know the education exists. And someone once told me that a true measure of any education is whether or not that education provides you with the tools necessary to go out into the world with confidence. And by that standard, traveling was without a doubt the best education I've ever received. I began to discover interests I never knew I had. Documenting the happenings of the day on my travels in my travel journal at night, I began to find my voice as a writer, and I still write to this day. Whenever I was having a bad day or needing a pickup, I would find solace peering through my viewfinder and my camera, and I fell in love with photography, and I owned my own photography company today. I was introduced to the adventure world for the first time in my life. I never had time to go hiking or biking or climbing as I was always playing baseball or American football or working on the farm. When I returned to the U.S., I've actively sought out that adventure world wherever I go. I like to say that my formal education gave me all the pieces to the puzzle, but traveling helped me start to put them together. Like, I'm not, it's not complete, but it helped me see the bigger picture. Now, I always tell my friends and whoever asks, when they, they should, I always recommend they go traveling, but there's many reasons and they, they bring up why that they just can't do it. And I agree, there's many reasons why not to go traveling. And there's never really a good time to go traveling. I think the best time to go is when you're young, before life happens. But there's, there's always an excuse, there's always a reason why not to go, a wedding or whatever. But I'd like to discuss the two reasons that I hear most often here today, and that's that the world's just too dangerous today, and uh, they just can't afford it. Well, on the first point, you can't judge the world by what you see on the news. The world's a very big place, and I would not have been able to do a fraction of the things that I've done on the road without the generosity and numerous random acts of kindness from complete strangers. It's overwhelming. I can't, you can't even quantify that I, I, you're on from hitchhiking through Africa to somebody picking you up and taking you into their home for the night or feeding you or simply having a conversation when you see you're struggling to buy a loaf of bread in a different language. You see, I found that people are just as curious about my culture as I am theirs and often willing to give a helping hand. And I reference the fact that we Americans tend to, adjust, uh, to judge the world by what we see on the news Let's take, for instance, like Country X. You see on the news, Country X, over their biggest holiday weekend, had 82 people that were shot, and 14 of those people died as a result of their injuries. Now, if we watch that, that headline will be like, oh, my goodness, that's got to be, we can't go there. That whole country, that whole region is off limits. But what if I were to tell you that that country was the United States, and those were the actual statistics that happened this past 4th of July weekend in 2014 in the city of Chicago. Now, most of us that live in the U.S., we understand that the U.S. is a very big place, and that was an isolated incident, and, and heck, we would probably even recommend people to go visit Chicago over the 4th of July. Don't judge everything by what you see on the TV. And secondly, yes, traveling does take money, like everything in the world. But you have to remember, you, you're not on the vacation here, you're going traveling. You're not, you're not staying at the nicest hotels, resorts, or eating at the nicest restaurants. You're staying in hostels. You're doing home stays. You're doing work stays. There's so many volunteer organizations out there where you can work in exchange for a place to stay and something to eat. You're going to places of the world where you take advantage of your exchange rate. Our dollar goes a lot farther than it does here. And if you believe my argument that Traveling is an education, it has an educational value. Just simply look at what we Americans spend on education in this country. There's over $1.2 trillion in outstanding student loan debt in this country that I think look, when viewed in that light, traveling is a bargain. Because as higher education becomes more and more expensive, we have to look at alternatives or ways to complement our education. And I think traveling is a very viable alternative or way to complement that. Now, if you also, if you believe that traveling has an educational value, then with any education, there's usually a test, a way to kind of 
put what you learned to use. And traveling is no different. Because the test happens whenever you return home. Because that is, in my opinion, by far the most difficult part of the entire traveling experience. Because you see, you return home and you're your family and your friends and everybody expects the same person to return but you're not you see the world a little differently because you've had different life experiences you've gone different places of the world where things shouldn't work but they do and you've had these life-changing experiences so you come home and you're seeing your home culture your home country for the first time maybe in your life because you're seeing it through a new lens and you have to reconcile that old world and this new world and when you're seeing this new world, you're seeing things that you like, but you also see things that you don't like. Things that your home country, your culture, that they don't do so well. And that can be very troubling. I know I had a hard time with it for a very long time. But I also know when my per perception of my home country changed, and that's when I was still living in Tanzania with, a, with the Maasai. And I was living there for about a month, and I'd heard so much about this very sacred meeting ceremony that they have in the Maasai culture. It's called an orpul. And basically an orpul, when you boil it down, is basically you take a, a cow or a calf to a sacred place in the bush or up on top of a mountain, and you don't leave orpul until you eat that entire animal. And after a month of living there, I'd heard so much about it, and I, one of my friends, his name was Daniel, and he was a Maasai, and he spoke very good English. And I finally convinced him to talked to his father, Nujuma, and a couple of his brothers to let me have my own or pool. And I couldn't afford a cow or a calf, so I bought, my, I bought a goat. So one afternoon, we, we start walking up the mountain, tied up the goat, and have machetes. We start building ourselves a little protective crowd where we would sleep in that night. And it, it didn't take very long. It was a very rudimentary structure, and we slaughtered the animal, made a fire, and we went to bed. I was asleep for about, I don't know, half hour, an hour, when I heard the most terrifying sound of my life, about a foot from my head, and I woke up, and I didn't know what was going on, and I looked over to see Nunjuma stoking the fire, and he just looked at me, and he said, Fisi, Fisi, which in Swahili means hyena. You see, they, they smelled the blood from the, the goat carcass, and they had come to see what they can get, and that rudimentary structure that we had put up in 30 minutes was the only thing protecting us from the hyenas at night. So needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night. And over two days of not sleeping and eating nothing but goat meat, goat stew, and whatever else came out of a goat, I was on top of my game. <laughs> but on the third day, Najum and I started having a conversation through his son, Daniel, who was translating for us. And I was learning all about the importance of cattle and their culture. Now that it's viewed as a bank account, and it's a social status, now dowries to this day are still paid with cattle to buy their bride, and then he started asking me questions, and his first question kind of took me off guard, and he said, who will win, Obama or Hillary? And you have to understand, this is in the summer of 2007, just during the Democratic run-up to a U.S. election in the U.S., and, but the thing that really surprised me was is that Nujuma didn't speak Swahili, which is, or English, which is the language of any international publication, he spoke Ma, which is only a verbal language. So he was hearing this secondhand. And I answered the best I could. And I basically said that, ah, oh, it's too early. It's hard to tell. Kind of brushed it off. But then he asked me the second question. He said, how long will it take for me to walk to America? And I spent about five, ten minutes trying to explain to him the concept of an ocean. And he just didn't, couldn't fathom, couldn't grasp the concept of an ocean. So here's a man that by virtually any standard was, would be deemed uneducated. But still yet, he taught me the importance of my home country and the importance of a presidential election in my home country to his life as a semi-nomadic cattle herder in the middle of nowhere in East Africa. He may technically be uneducated, but he taught me a lot that day. As you see, conversations just like those with people all over the world. It could be in a cafe in the Himalayas or in Hong Kong. Those are, the, those are your lecture halls. Those are your classrooms. Those are your textbooks. That's where you're learning about other cultures and you're learning about the world. And with each conversation in each country being its own chapter. 
And you see, I would like to leave you with a quote today, a kind of along those same lines. It came from St. Augustine of Hippo, who was a philosopher around 400 AD. He lived in the world, it was a very different place. But even then, he understood the importance of travel. He said, the world is a book, and those who don't travel read only a page. I can honestly say that I've just started to read this book, and it's, it's fascinating. It's a real page turner. I, I highly recommend you pick it up one day. You won't regret it. Thank you.